Welcome back everyone, I'm History with Hilbert, and today I'm going to be talking about the politics of Dark Age Britain. Now today, Britain is divided into three countries, Scotland, England and Wales, but back then the situation was a lot more complicated. Now I'm going to start off by talking about the Romans, because they had a large impact on what Britain would look like and the peoples of Britain for many years to come. So, the Romans conquered most of Britain, although when they got to the north of England, they built a big wall, Hadrian's Wall, in AD 122, to keep out the northerners, who we now call the Picts, although they were probably a different mix of various Celtic tribes. Now, the Romans also built a wall further north, which was the Antonine Wall, but this one was soon scrapped. However, this feeling of that the people below the wall became civilised and became known as the Romano Britons, whereas the people north of the wall generally became known as the Picts, is an important distinction to make. Because when the Romans left Britain, around the start of the 5th century AD, the peoples who weren't civilised by the Romans, the Picts north of the wall, and the Irish from across the Irish Sea, both invaded the land of the Britons, who no longer had the Romans to help. Now, for the rest of the story, we need to cross over the North Sea to the countries that are today the Netherlands, Germany and Denmark, but back then were very different and were inhabited by various tribes, such as the Frisians, the Jutes, the Angles and the Saxons, who the last three are the main groups who we think came over during the Anglo-Saxon migration, although it's possible that other peoples such as the Batavi or the Franks, and even perhaps the Huns, actually moved over with the Anglo-Saxon migration in smaller numbers as well. Now, when the Romano-Britons called for help around the time of 440 AD, it wasn't the Romans who answered the call like they thought they would, but rather two warrior brothers, probably Jutes, who were called Hengist and Horsa, which means something like stallion and horse in, I believe, Old English or Old Jutish. And they really did sort out the Irish and Pictish problem that the Romano-Britons were having. And the Picts and the Irish for the next few years decided to stay away because now they had these new guys who were being their bodyguards essentially. Now in 440, around the same time after they have defeated the Picts and the Irish, they are essentially now the mercenaries, these bodyguard figures of the Romano-Britons, and the name that's passed down through the years is of a British king called Vortigern, although this is probably a later invention to make the story a bit more seamless. And they are in fact given the county of Kent as a thank you. However, as time goes on and as they fight more battles and win more wars for the Britons, Hengist and Horsa and the others invite a lot more of their friends over, and they keep wanting more money and more land and more food. And eventually this comes to a head, and they eventually rise up and rebel against their British masters. In fact, at an event called the Night of the Long Knives, not the one in Germany, this one was a lot earlier in um, under the Stones of Stonehenge, they actually completely rise up and kill a large part of the British nobility. And from then on is the real centuries-long struggle beginning around 450 AD between the Anglo-Saxons down in the very south of England, then slowly pushing the Britons up into the western corners of the British Isles. Now another interesting thing is that at the same time, and possibly caused by the um, defeat of the Picts by these Anglo-Saxon invaders, we also see a shift of people from Northern Ireland into southwestern Scotland, forming the kingdom that became known as Dal Rieda. And Dal Rieda, although it's not entirely sure, there is some debate as to whether they did actually come from Ireland and didn't just originate in southwestern Scotland. Generally speaking, that's the idea because they spoke a Q-Celtic language which were the languages spoken in Ireland rather than P-Celtic, which was the one spoken on mainland Britain. But to return to mainland Britain, after the defeat of various British Celtic kingdoms, and this was an ongoing process, it wasn't that they were suddenly defeated, it did take hundreds of years, we can see that a lot of these small Anglo-Saxon Germanic kingdoms start to form around the start of the 6th century AD. Some were formed earlier, some were formed a little later. And you can see that it's a real patchwork of these different kingdoms that are formed. But then again, these kingdoms would have existed next to and sometimes surrounded by these British Celtic kingdoms that were slowly wiped out as time went on. 
Now, in the very south, we see that the Jutes formed the least of the kingdoms, and the most important and largest Jutish kingdom that was formed was the kingdom of Kent. Now, as well as Kent, a little known other Jutish kingdom, or two actually, would be the Witwara, which are the inhabitants of the Isle of Wight in the very south, as well as the Mayonwara, which were the inhabitants of the Mayon Valley, um, which is a little more inland. But this was probably soon swallowed up by the expanding kingdom of Wessex or Mercia, depending on which one got there first. Now, the Saxons had a few more kingdoms and were slightly more numerous in number, and they mostly settled in the south of England. So you had Wessex, Sussex, and Essex are the main kingdoms that they formed, although you also had several others like the Hastingas and the Hwicca. And these kingdoms, a lot of them end in the sex or the sax pronoun, and it's not a pronoun. And um, this comes from the type of weapon they were using, which also gives rise to the name Saxon. This weapon was called the sax. And actually an interesting fact is that the Saxons who stayed on the continent in modern day Germany, they still used a sax, which was longer than the one which became used in the British Isles, although we don't know exactly why that was. Finally, the Angles from Angelm in uh, Denmark, they inhabited the north and the eastern seaboard of Britain, forming various kingdoms there. But around 600 AD, we can say although they usually existed with other kingdoms and they were forcing tribute from them, that we get a situation called the Anglo-Saxon Heptarchy. And a Heptarchy is the rule of seven kingdoms. And these would be Northumbria, Mercia, East Anglia, Wessex and Kent. And now I know what you're thinking, has Hilbert forgotten how to do maths again? Because he said seven kingdoms, but there are only five on the screen. Well, not quite, because if you remember, Northumbria could be divided into Bernicia and Deira in the south. And this is still kept in the Heptarchy, so although it was most of the time one kingdom after Athelfrith united the two around the start of the 7th century, they are sometimes counted as two because they do split depending on the fortunes of Northumbria. So let's take this opportunity to take a break from the Anglo-Saxons, although we'll go back to them very soon, and let's have a look at the Romano-Britons or the Britons and what they're doing at this time. So they eventually were pushed onto the very western seaboard of Britain. Now, you have various kingdoms. Wales remained the strong point of the Britons. That was essentially the Celtic powerhouse in Britain at this time. And Wales was divided into several kingdoms. In the north, you had a very powerful kingdom called Gwynedd. And Gwynedd was one which often got involved with Anglo-Saxon politics and supported various Anglo-Saxon factions. Now, to the south, you had Powys, Gwent, and Defeth, but these kingdoms didn't really do too much against their uh, Anglo-Saxon neighbours, although Powys and Gwent did often find themselves fighting against the Mercians. Now, Mercia actually comes from an old English word, and I'm sorry, Kevin, if I'm going to mispronounce this, but I think it's Merche, and that's where we get the word march from. And essentially, a march means the borderland, so the Mercians were literally the border people with the Welsh, or uh, the Wallach, I think they're called, to the west. Now, to the south of Wales, you also had a pocket of Celtic resistance in Cornwall, and this kingdom was called Domnonia, and that's also one of the reasons why the Cornish language, this Celtic language, was retained in Cornwall for such a long time, because it remained Celtic, and its population wasn't displaced by Germanic speakers until a lot later, which is why Cornish existed and say they don't speak a Celtic language in London. Now in the north you have a few kingdoms which are called by the Welsh and by the uh, ancient Britons or the Romano Britons or whatever you want to call them at this point, which were called the Hen Ogledd, and this means the Old North. And one of these kingdoms situated around modern day Cumbria is Hreged. Hreged had a few famous kings, probably the most famous one is this guy called the Urian, and he was very successful in fighting against several Anglian kings against the kings of Northumbria, although they were finally defeated and incorporated into the Northumbrian kingdom. To the north of Threged, you have the kingdom centred around Strathclyde, which was probably called back then Alt Clut, and these were also Britons living around the area of the Clyde, uh, probably around where Glasgow is now and going south a bit as well. 
and to the north of them around the area of modern day Edinburgh you had a people called the Godovin and these people are famous because they are mentioned in a very old Welsh poem which was called the I uh Godovin and the I uh Godovin essentially tells the story of how the Godovin tried to force the Northumbrians back into the sea and they were all massacred at a battle called Catrath, which probably happened in Catterick in modern day Yorkshire. Now, although they are possibly related to the Britons, the Picts are usually seen as a people apart, possibly because they'd been living there for a bit longer and they were more sort of indigenous than the other quote unquote Celtic populations of the British Isles. But the Picts essentially can also be divided into several sub kingdoms which are here on the screen in front of you. And these sub-kingdoms are thought to have acted a little like the petty kingdoms of Ireland at the same time, in that although there were several kingdoms, generally one kingdom would often dominate the others, and one would have a king, a high king, which would rule over the others, even that there would be a northern high king sometimes, and at other times a southern high king, and that sometimes there will be wars between them. So Pictish society can be, can be quite difficult to get a grasp of. And actually an interesting thing about Pictish society is that unlike most other kingdoms at the time, certainly in Britain at this time, instead of it going from father to son, that the kingship would be passed down from father to son, it was matrilineal. So it would go down through the mother's side of the family rather than the father's side of the family, which is very interesting. Now, another distinction which I mentioned previously, but we'll go into some detail, is the invasion of the Northern Irish Dal Riadans from, obviously, Northern Ireland into southwestern Scotland and the Isles. And actually, it's not Pictish, which was the ancestor of modern Scots Gaelic, but it's this Irish language, Old Irish, which came in through the Dal Riadans who introduced Scottish Gaelic to the Highlands and which later completely usurped the Pictish language. Now these guys were Northern Irish and they probably came from a kingdom related to the Aeneal who were a very powerful kingdom in Northern Ireland. But when they did invade the western seaboard of Scotland, the Picts and the Britons of Strathclyde were not too happy with this. And essentially Scottish history from this point on is a big power struggle between mainly the Picts and Dalriada, with Strathclyde often getting involved on one side or the other. And the Dalriadans are a very interesting culture and they seem to have been, rather than a very um, infantry based or cavalry based society, they appear to have been quite a seaman based society. And they often had 20 houses which were exactly the amount needed to man the oars on one of their vessels. So actually one of the interesting things is that they were supporting obviously the Dalriadan kingdom in Ireland for a time. And while the Dal Raidens in Ireland had to provide men for the army, the Dal Raidens in Scotland had to provide a navy to fight alongside the Irish Dal Raiden army. At the end of the 6th and the start of the 7th centuries, the Dal Raidens did a lot of expanding, especially in their Scottish territories, which were allowed to act rather independently from their Irish territories under a king named Aidan. And although Aidan was later defeated by the Northumbrians in the year 603 at a battle called Dexaston, he did a lot to expand the kingdom and expand the influence of Dalriada, although for much of its history, Dalriada was fighting very hard not to be wiped out by the Picts or by the Britons of Strathclyde or the Northumbrians for that matter. Now, we have to quickly look at the introduction of Christianity because it's often thought that there was just one Christian church trying to convert the pagans or the various pagans living in the British Isles. But actually the story of Christendom being reintroduced into Britain after the Romans is one of two churches, one of which was the Celtic church from Ireland and the other of which was the Roman church which was introduced through Europe through the Christian Franks. The Celtic Church came in through, obviously, the Irish when they invaded with Dal Riada, and the Dal Riadans were already Christians. Now, the Romano Britons actually were also Christians, but they weren't the ones who converted the Anglo Saxons, which is rather interesting. And the Romano British Christian tradition was also a bit different. It also had different pagan influences and such things. So that's essentially a third church, but they didn't convert the Anglo-Saxons 
all the various other tribes. Now, the um, Celtic Christendom came in, obviously, through the Dal Raidens into Scotland, and they were the ones who then went on to convert the Picts, first the Northern Picts and then the Southern Picts. There was a distinction between when they were converted. And actually, when King Oswald of Northumbria regained the throne of his kingdom after the Battle of Heavenfield, he too was a Christian, and he had the Irish monks build a monastery at the very famous location of Lindisfarne. And from there, Irish Christendom, Celtic Christendom, spread among the people of Northumbria. However, in the south, around about the same time that Iona was founded, which was in on a Scottish island and was one of the Dal Reden's sacred places uh, for their uh, Celtic Christian religion, this around about the same time, the first Christian missionaries from Francia start to come into Britain and we see that they come into Kent and actually it was thanks to uh, King Athelbert of Kent. His wife was a Frankish princess and because she was a Frank she was also a Christian and King Athelbert of Kent was the first Anglo-Saxon king to convert to Christendom and soon this Roman Christendom spread into East Anglia and actually East Anglia is where Edwin, who was another king before Oswald of Northumbria, became a Roman Christian and he tried to convert Northumbria to Roman Christendom, although this had failed. And actually that's why Northumbria was the only one of the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms which was a Celtic Christian kingdom for much of its history rather than a Roman Christian kingdom which eventually converted the other kingdoms. But if we go back to our map of the other kingdoms, we have some more political discussion to do. And actually, each one of the kingdoms of the Heptarchy had a moment in the spotlight, which is why they are counted to the Anglo-Saxon Heptarchy, whereas all the little ones weren't. So, to begin with, around 580 AD, again, the dates are approximate, you get the ascension of the Kingdom of Wessex, which remember was the Kingdom of the West Saxons in the southwest of England, centred around what's now sort of, um, I believe the capital was at Winchester, so it's sort of the area of Somerset and Dorset, that kind of southwesterly region. And the men of Wessex had a king called Caolin, and it's said that Caolin was the king of the South Humbrians or the English south of the Humber. So he probably exerted a lot of influence over the precursor states to Mercia, as well as probably exacting tribute from East Anglia and Kent. Although Northumbria at this time, they didn't manage to exact tribute from them because they were probably too far from their sphere of influence. Although again, it goes to show that Wessex was back then a powerful figure. And Wessex wouldn't become this powerful again, to my knowledge, up until King Alfred, when Wessex was the great unifying force behind the Kingdom of England, which would be about three to four centuries after this. Now, I already mentioned King Athelbert of Kent, and he's significant because he's the first Christian Anglo-Saxon king. He converted to Christendom in 597 AD, which was again around about the same time that Christendom was starting to enter the north of Britain through the Dal Reardons. And after this time, he is also called by Bede one of the Bretwalder. And Bretwalder actually means King of Britain or ruler of the Britons. Uh, and Britons is in the people of Britain rather than the Romano Britons. It all gets a bit confusing. Or ruler of over the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms is essentially what's meant. And he was seen as this Bretwalder figure. So he also exerted control over again. I think it's described as all peoples to the south of the Humber, which again excludes Northumbria, who at this time was just starting to ascend under the kingship of King Athelfrith. After the defeat of Athelbert of Kent in battle against the men of Wessex, we see the rise of the Kingdom of East Anglia. And this is very interesting actually because it's under a king named Radvald. And Radvald is most likely the king who was buried with the Sutton Hoo stuff. So the helmet of the Sutton Hoo burial, which again is, is my little profile picture with the sunglasses on, that is most likely his helmet or someone very high up in his kingdom's helmet and he was he probably knew very much 
about the Sutton Hill burial if he didn't order it, which he probably did as well. And the East Anglians at this time were a very powerful people. Now I mentioned previously a King Athelfrith, and he was one of the Bretwalder. He commanded a, a lot of influence. He even marched armies down into Mercia, down into Wales, um, to subdue the Kingdom of Gwynedd, who were rebelling against him and greatly expanded the Northumbrian land. But he was killed in battle, and so King Radwald could take his place as the Bretwalder, commanding influence all across the south. And actually, Radwald was the one who had helped another king, who King Athelfrith's had killed his father. He was an exile from the southern Northumbrian kingdom of Deira, and his name was Edwin, and actually Radwald had helped him. So he had an ally in Edwin up north, who, as I mentioned previously, converted to the Roman Christian religion as well. Now, after the time of uh, King Radwald, we get an ascension of the Northumbrians, starting under King Athelfrith, who was before, and then continuing with King Edwin, who both expanded Northumbrian influence, who directly subjugated areas like Dalriada, Man, Gwynedd, and Mercia, and exacted tribute from East Anglia and Wessex. Now, Bede says that they didn't exact tribute or uh, any kind of had any kind of control over the Kingdom of Kent, although this could technically be Bede trying to say, oh look at Kent, how good they were because they were the first Christians. Bede was a monk after all and they were prone to doing this, but it's possible that Kent was just really strong and didn't give in to the Northumbrians. Northumbrians are very interesting in this period. Their successes fluctuate as the Mercians and the Welsh band together to try and attack them. They then went into exile and then you have the return of successful kings such as King Oswald or King Oswy. And finally we get to the ascension and the supremacy of the Mercians. And the Mercian supremacy really begins in earnest under a king named Penda. Now Mercia hadn't been united that long before Penda got to the throne. And Penda is famous for being either the last or the most famous, and the guy who went out with a bang, the most famous king of um, the pagan Anglo-Saxons. And Penda obviously is very much looked down upon by the sources because they were all being written by Christian monks. But Penda is a really cool guy. I think his story is really awesome, uh, even though he's a Mercian. And he actually was the one who's killed, I think he killed two Northumbrian kings and at least one king of Wessex. I think it's said that he killed about five different Anglo-Saxon kings in his time. And when he was king of Mercia, they managed to, at various times, ravage the lands of Northumbria and Wessex, as well as directly subjugating East Anglia and Kent, as well as a lot of the smaller kingdoms, incorporating them into Mercia, which I think after Northumbria, or even before Northumbria, became the biggest Anglo-Saxon kingdom at the time. And it's actually from this point on, from probably the mid-7th century up until about the 10th century, or slightly into the 9th century that the um, this period is known as the Mercian supremacy because the the Mercians were the big cheese at the time often controlling all the land south of the Humber although the Northumbrians were just too good they just couldn't conquer them because Northumbria is the best all right guys so thank you very much for watching I hope this video hasn't gone on too long and that it's not been too dull but this is a topic that I really enjoy talking about, and I hope you guys do too. Let me know if you enjoyed the animations and the little cartoons. I've been working quite hard on making these bots look a little bit better, a little bit different than normal, to go with the vibrance and the colour of the era that I still like to call the Dark Ages. So, thanks very much for watching. Don't forget to leave a like, a comment, and a subscribe. I'd very much appreciate your support. And don't forget to tune in again next time. Thank you.